Chapter 6 of Four Day Planet by H. Beam Piper. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Four Day Planet. Chapter 6. Elementary, my dear Kyvelson. Before we left the lighted elevator car, we took a quick nose count. Besides the Kyvelsons, there were five javelin men Ramon Llewellyn, Abdullah Monahan, Abe Clifford, Cesario Vieira, and a white beard named Piet Dumont. Al Devis had been with us when we crashed the door out of the meeting room, but he'd fallen by the way. We had a couple of flashlights, so, after sending the car down to bottom level, we picked our way up the zigzag iron stairs to the catwalk, under the seventy-foot ceiling, and sat down in the dark. Joe Kyvelson was fretting about what would happen to the rest of his men. Fine captain I am, running out and leaving them. If they couldn't keep up, that's their tough luck, Oscar Fujisawa told him. You brought out all you could. If you'd waited any longer, none of us would have gotten out. They won't bother with them, I added. You and Tom and Oscar here are the ones they want. Joe was still letting himself be argued into thinking he'd done the right thing when we saw the lights of a lorry coming up from uptown at ceiling level. A moment later it backed to the catwalk, and Bish Ware stuck his head out from the pilot's seat. "'Where do you gentlemen wish to go?' he asked. "'To the javelin,' Joe said instantly. "Uh "'Uh-uh,' Oscar disagreed. "'That's the first place they'll look. That'll be all right for Ramon and the others, but if they catch you and Tom, they'll shoot you and call it self-defense, or take you in and beat both of you to a jelly. This'll blow over in fifteen or twenty hours, but I'm not going anywhere near my ship now.' Drop us off on second level down, about 8th Street, and a couple of blocks from the docks, the mate Llewellyn said. We'll borrow some weapons from Patel the pawnbroker, and then circulate around and see what's going on. But you and Joe and Oscar had better go underground for a while. The Times, I said. We have a whole pillar building to ourselves. We could hide half the population." That was decided upon. We all piled into the lorry, and Bish took it to an inconspicuous place on the second level and let down. Ramon Llewellyn and the others got out. Then we went up to main city level. We passed within a few blocks of Hunter's Hall. There was a lot of noise, but no shooting. Joe Kyvelson didn't have anything to say on the trip, but he kept looking at the pilot seat in perplexity and apprehension. I think he expected Bish to try and ram the lorry through every building we passed by or over. We found Dad in the editorial department on the top floor, feeding voice tape to Julio while the latter made master sheets for teleprinting. I gave him a quick rundown on what had happened that he hadn't gotten from my radio. Dad cluck-clucked in disapproval, either at my getting into a fight, assaulting an officer, or literally throwing money away. Bish Ware seemed a little troubled. "'I think,' he said, "'that I shall make a circuit of my diocese and see what can be learned from my devoted flock. Should I turn up anything significant, I will call it in.' With that he went tottering over to the elevator, stumbling on the way, and making an unepiscopal remark. I watched him, and then turned to Dad. Did he have anything to drink after I left? I asked. Nothing but about five cups of coffee. I mentally marked that. Add oddities. Bish Ware. He'd been at least four hours without liquor, and he was walking as unsteadily as when I'd first seen him at the spaceport. I didn't know any kind of liquor that would persist like that. Julio had at least an hour's tape to transcribe, so Dad and Joe and Tom and Oscar and I went to the living room on the floor below. Joe was still being bewildered about Bish Ware. "'How'd he manage to come for us?' he wanted to know. "'Why, he was here with me all evening,' Dad said. "'He came from the spaceport with Walt and Tom and had dinner with us.' He called a few people from here and found out about the fake riot and police raid Ravik had cooked up. 
you'd be surprised at how much information he can pick up around town. Joe looked at his son, alarmed. Hey, you let him see, he began. The wax on bottom level in the fourth ward, I asked. He won't blab about that. He doesn't blab things where they oughtn't be blabbed. That's right. Dad backed me up. He was beginning to think of Bish as one of the time staff now. We got a lot of tips from him, but nothing we give him gets out. He got his pipe lit again. What about that wax, Joe? he asked. Were you serious when you made that motion about a price of seventy-five centisoles? I sure was, Joe declared. That's the real price, and always has been. And that's what we get, or Capstad doesn't get any more wax. If Morell can top it, maybe Capstad won't get any more wax, period, I said. Who's he with? Interstellar Import-Export? Anybody would have thought a barbed-wire worm had crawled onto Joe Kyvelson's chair seat under him. "'Where'd you hear that?' he demanded, which is the galaxy's silliest question to ask any newsman. "'Tom, if you've been talking—' "'He hasn't,' I said. "'He didn't need to. It sticks out a parsec in all directions.' I mentioned some of the things I'd noticed while interviewing Morell, and his behavior after leaving the ship. Even before I talked to him, I wondered why Tom was so anxious to get aboard with me. He didn't know we'd arranged to put Morell up here. He was going to take him to see that wax, and then take him to the javelin. You were going to produce him at the meeting and have him bid against Belcher, only that tread snail fouled your lines for you. So then you thought you had to stall off a new contract till he got out of the hospital. The two Kyvelsons and Oscar Fujisawa were looking at one another, Joe and Tom in consternation, and Oscar in derision of both of them. I was feeling pretty good. Brother, I thought, Sherlock Holmes never did better himself. That, all of a sudden, reminded me of Dr. John Watson, whom Bish perceived to have been in Afghanistan. That was one thing Sherlock H. Boyd hadn't deduced any answers for. Well, give me a little more time, and more data. You got it all figured out, haven't you? Joe was asking sarcastically. The sarcasm was as hollow as an empty oil drum. The Times, Dad was saying, trying not to sound too proud, has a very sharp reportorial staff, Joe. It isn't interstellar, Oscar told me, grinning. It's Argentine exotic organics. You know, everybody thought Joe here was getting pretty high-toned, sending his daughter to school on Terra. School wasn't the only thing she went for. We got a letter from her the last time the Cape Canaveral was in, saying that she'd contacted Argentine Organics, and that a man was coming out on the Painaminda, posing as a travel book author. Well, he's here now. You'd better keep an eye on him, I advised. If Steve Ravick gets to him, he won't be much use to you. You think Ravick would really harm Morell? Dad asked. He thought so, too. He was just trying to comfort himself by pretending he didn't. "'What do you think, Ralph?' Oscar asked him. "'If we get competitive wax-buying again, seventy-five a pound will be the starting price. I'm not spending the money till I get it, but I wouldn't be surprised to see wax go to a sol a pound on the loading floor here. And you know what that would mean.' Thirty for Steve Ravick,' Dad said. That puzzled Oscar, till I explained that thirty is New Z's for the end. I guess Walt's right. Ravick would do anything to prevent that. He thought for a moment. Joe, you were using the wrong strategy. You should have let Ravick get that thirty-five cent a sole price established for the cooperative, and then had Morell offer seventy-five or something like that. You crazy? Joe demanded. 
Why, then the co-op would have been stuck with it. That's right, and as soon as Morell's price was announced, everybody would drop out of the cooperative and reclaim their wax, even the captains who owe Ravik money. He'd have nobody left but a handful of thugs and barflies. But that would smash the cooperative, Joe Kyvelson objected. Listen, Ralph, I've been in the cooperative all my life, since before Steve Ravick was heard of on this planet. I've worked hard for the cooperative, and— You didn't work hard enough, I thought. You let Steve Ravick take it away from you. Dad told Joe pretty much the same thing. You don't have a cooperative, Joe. Steve Ravick has a racket. The only thing you can do with this organization is smash it, and then rebuild it with Ravik and his gang left out. Joe puzzled over that silently. He'd been thinking that it was the same cooperative his father and Simon McGregor and the other old hunters had organized, and that getting rid of Ravik was simply a matter of voting him out. He was beginning to see now that parliamentary procedure wasn't any weapon against Ravik's force and fraud and intimidation. I think Walt has something, Oscar Fujisawa said. As long as Morell's in the hospital at the spaceport, he's safe. But as soon as he gets out of Odin Dock and shipyard territory, he is going to be a clay pigeon. Tom hadn't been saying anything. Now he cleared his throat. On the Painaminda, I was talking about taking Mr. Morell for a trip in the Javelin, he said. That was while we were still pretending he'd come here to write a book. Maybe that would be a good idea anyhow. It's a cinch we can't let him get killed on us, his father said. I doubt if exotic organics would send anybody else out if he was. Here, Dad said. We'll run the story we have on him in the morning edition and then correct it and apologize to the public for misleading them and explain in the evening edition. And before he goes, we can have him make an audio-visual for the cast, telling everybody who he is and announcing the price he's offering. We'll put that on the air. Get enough publicity, and Steve Ravick won't dare do anything to him. Publicity, I thought, is the only weapon Dad knows how to use. He thinks it's invincible. Me? I wouldn't bet on what Steve Ravick wouldn't dare do if you gave me a hundred to one. Ravick had been in power too long, and he was drunker on it than Bish Ware ever got on Baldur Honey Rum. As an intoxicant, rum is practically a soft drink beside power. Well, do you think Ravick's gotten on to Morell yet? Oscar said. We kept that a pretty close secret. Joe and I knew about him, and so did the Mahatma and Nip Spazoni and Corkscrew Finnegan, and that was all. I didn't even tell Tom here till the Painaminda got into radio range, Joe Kyvelson said. Then I only told him and Ramon and Abdullah and Abe and Hans Kronji. And Al Devis, Tom added. He came into the conning tower while you were telling the rest of us. The communication screen began buzzing, and I went and put it on. It was Bish Ware, calling from a pay booth somewhere. I have some early returns, he said. The cops cleared everybody out of Hunter's Hall, except the Ravik gang. Then Ravik reconvened the meeting with nobody but his gang. They were very careful to make sure they had enough for a legal quorum under the bylaws, and then they voted to accept the new price of thirty-five centisoles a pound. That's what I was afraid of, Joe Kyvelson said. Did they arrest any of my crew? Not that I know of, Bish said. They made a few arrests, but turned everybody loose later. They're still looking for you and your son. As far as I know, they aren't interested in anybody else. He glanced hastily over his shoulder, as though to make sure the door of the booth was secure. I'm with some people now. I'll call you back later. Well, that's that, Joe, Oscar said, after Bish blanked the screen. The Ravik co-op stuck with the price cut. 
The only thing left to do is get everybody out of it we can and organize a new one. I guess that's so, Joe agreed. I wonder, though, if Ravik has really got wise to Morell. Walt figured it out since the ship got in, Oscar said. Belcher's been on the ship with Morell for six months. Well, call it three. Everything speeds up about double in hyperspace. But in three months, he ought to see as much as Walt saw in a couple of hours. Well, maybe Belcher doesn't know what's suspicious the way Walt does, Tom said. I'm sure he doesn't, I said. But he and Morell are both in the wax business. I'll bet he noticed dozens of things I never even saw. Then we'd better take awfully good care of Mr. Morell, Tom said. Get him aboard as fast as we can and get out of here with him. Walt, you're coming along, aren't you? That was what we agreed while Glenn Morell was still the famous travel book author. I wanted to get out of it now. There wouldn't be anything happening aboard the Javelin, and a lot happening here in Port Sandor. Dad had the same idea, only he was one hundred percent for my going with Morell. I think he wanted me out of Port Sandor, where I wouldn't get in the way of any small, high-velocity particles of lead that might be whizzing around. End of chapter 6